Hello, and welcome to Touchstone Music. I'm currently doing a series on music and albums from the 1960s. These are albums I purchased when they were first released in the 1960s, and which have been musical touchstones for me ever since. My goal is to introduce these wonderful albums to people who haven't heard them before, and to reintroduce them to people who have, but perhaps haven't listened to them for a while. A uh, fair disclosure, this uh, video contains no music clips, only my commentary. Today, we feature an album that is a true example of 67 psychedelia acid rock. Electric Music for the Mind and Body by Country Joe and the Fish. Okay, let's talk about the band. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. Country Joe McDonald and Barry the Fish Melton toured the folk circuit as a duo in 1965. Now, first, how did they get their nicknames? Here's one version. McDonald's parents admired communist leader Joseph Stalin and named their son Joe after him, although they eventually uh, rejected communism. The country nickname also refers to Stalin, who was known as Country Joe. Melton's nickname apparently comes from the famous quote by the Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong, the gorilla must move amongst the people as a fish swims in the sea. So now we know, or do we? Because I've also seen at least one other version of this, so maybe we can hear some, some of the comments. People will give me some ideas. Barry Melton has been quoted as saying in, the, in their early days as folkies, now remember, they, they were young. We were all young once. They looked down on rock music. Uh, one quote I saw was, rock music was music played, by, played on the edge of town by people who didn't have mufflers on their cars. Oh, tell us how you really feel. Uh, folk, on the other hand, was played in coffee houses near university campuses. Folk was legitimate music, something to be discussed. Music of the working class. However, in 1965 or early 1966, McDonald and Melton saw the Butterfield Blues Band performing live, reportedly while the duo were high on LSD. Now remember, in those days, LSD was legal. The pair became convinced that electric music was also authentic music, they gradually added other members, electrified their set, cutting a couple of um, early EPs, which were kind of longer than, than the single-sided 45s, but shorter than the uh, full uh, albums. Joe McDonald specifically wanted an organist to be included after hearing Al Cooper playing on the uh, album uh, Highway 61 Revisited by Bob Dylan. Now, uh, We'll get a little uh, nerdy here. Uh, Cooper played a Hammond organ on Highway 61, but uh, David Cohen, who, who became the organist uh, for The Fish, uh, ended up with a more affordable Italian farfisa. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. So the Hammond organ is, is, is full-sounding. It's very breathy. It's more suitable for progressive rock bands such as Procol Harum, who we always looked at in a previous video, and Deep Purple at that time. Uh, the farfisa sound is thinner, funkier, and suited the fish's earthier sound. So you might say, oh, you mean like a church organ versus sort of a garage band organ? Not necessarily, because I believe that Richard Wright of Pink Floyd also played a farfisa, and it's hard to imagine anyone calling the Floyd a garage band. Uh, rock bands of the era typically included uh, long, improvisational, instrumental jams into their live sets. Audiences came to these concerts really expecting to hear this kind of music. Uh, they, were, they wanted to see, hear the band strive for this kind of spontaneous musical creativity and interplay. One song could last for hours on stage, depending on the, um, shall we say, psychological state of the band at the time. Uh, McDonald and Melton were also familiar with extended onstage jams from their folk days and gradually adopted that format into their electrified music. Additionally, unlike the coffeehouse audiences of their folk days, a lot of the audiences of their new uh, larger venues also came to dance. Uh, song lyrics were less important than a good backbeat and higher volume. The group entered the studio to cut their first full album in 1967 after some temporary confusion when the rest of the band became dissatisfied with their current drummer and he left. Uh, he was replaced by a Gary Chicken, Hirsch, whose drumming was much more suited to their music. Now, Hirsch has been quoted as saying he got his nickname because of his reluctance in his younger days to engage in some of the more daredevil antics young people sometimes attempt. So the band at the time of the recording of the album we're about to uh, look at is Country Joe McDonald, guitar, vocals, and harmonica, Barry Mountain, lead guitar, vocals, Gary Cohen, Farfisa organ and guitar, Bruce Bartle on bass, 
and Gary Chickenhirsch on drums. This group would shortly achieve a prominence on the world stage, along with other bands, at the Watershed uh, Monterey Pop Festival in June of 67. Other festival acts included Jefferson Airplane, The Who from England, The Mamas and Papas, Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, and Ravi Shankar, who was a sitar virtuoso and composer from India, also featured a relatively unknown guitarist, fresh back from England, named Jimi Hendrix. Two years later, The Fish would also be re- uh, featured at the Woodstock Music Festival in Woodstock, New York, and in the film of the same name. But for now, let's jump into the Wayback Machine and travel to a time a few months before the Monterey Pop Festival took place. So the recording uh, took place in the first week of February 1967, over about three days. The release date was 11th of May 1967. The producer is listed as uh, Samuel Charters. Now, I I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, American uh, music historian, writer, record producer, poet. This was a uh, sort of a Renaissance man. Uh, The engineer was uh, Robert D'Souza. The studios were Sierra Sound Studios in Berkeley, California. And the record label was Vanguard. Now, Vanguard were primarily known as a classical label, uh, but they would also occasionally record uh, jazz, folk, and blues artists. And the original length was about 43 and a half minutes. Well, the title, hmm, another great album title in my opinion, but I searched and searched and folks, I could find no info on its actual creation. Uh, My apologies again. I'll try and do better next time. So the sleeve design is accredited to Jules Halfant. He was an American painter and printmaker, and from 1953 to 1988, he was art director of Vanguard Records. Uh, He designed albums for many artists, including Country Joe and the Fish. The album cover itself shows uh, photos reportedly from a live performance at the Fillmore Auditorium in San Francisco and and prominently features the light shows of uh, those times. Speaking of light shows, um, I used to love the old uh, liquid light shows, um, but evidently they were very difficult to produce. They were very messy, and they didn't last too long. But while they were going, you can get kind of a feel for them if you buy uh, or look at a lava lamp. But honestly, folks, until you were experiencing it live with the kind of music and volumes of music in those days, you really can't get the full impact of it. As I say, I miss those. I wish I could somehow digitalize them. Hmm, Maybe that should be my next project, digitalizing liquid light shows. What do you think? I purchased the album sometime in 1968. As I've mentioned before, I purchased a lot of albums during that period. I'd first heard the album in the depths of a friend's uh, basement rec room, and I wanted to add it to my collection. It was the first psychedelic acid rock album I ever heard, or purchased. I recall being somewhat nervous at the time, purchasing it, taking it up to the cashier. I I think I was afraid he'd think I was some sort of drug-crazed hippie or something. I don't know what what I expect him to do or or, or say, but he took my money without comment, uh, and I breathed a sigh of relief as I exited the store with my ill-gotten gains safely wrapped in an anonymous uh, uh, brown uh, bag. And now let's talk about the music. Side one. Th- this album has been re- really a labor of love for me, but uh, to this uh, music, uh, to me, this music somewhat defies conventional analysis. Um, while the instrumentation often seems simplistic by today's standards, the music is highly inventive, innovative, and imaginative. Now, that's not to say the band wasn't influenced by other music and bands of the time, from Al Cooper, as we already know, up to The Doors. Uh, We've already mentioned they were inspired by the Butterfield Blues Band. Uh, But their free-form approach, everything from taking LSD while recording to switching instruments with each other on different songs, encouraged encouraged a highly uh, unconventional and creative music. Somewhat difficult uh, uh, to uh, define because it's hard hard to uh, compare it to anything else, which is usually what we do when we're talking about music. However, I will give it my uh, uh, best uh, attempt here. Song One Flying High is an infectious, up-tempo rocker. There's some really fine roots uh, singing, roots rock singing uh, by Joe. He seems to be relating a drug-fueled hitchhiking experience that he had. So typical of those times. Remember, LSD was legal until 1968. 
Also, I love those twangy guitars, electric vibrato, so typical of bands of that time. Now, song two, Not So Sweet, Mark to the Rain, which for some reason is always a song that comes to mind when I'm thinking of this album, and I always find myself humming it. <clears throat> the song uh, begins with a skinny sort of glissando from their uh, Farfisa organ. The song was distributed as a single, uh, the only one that came out of the uh, album, as I understand it, about a month before the album's release. Barry Melton sounds like guitarist uh, Robbie Krager from The Doors' Twin Brother in this track to me. Uh, the subject of the song, A Sweet Lorraine, sounds a bit of an urban poser the way Joe describes her in this song. Anyway, Joe laments that she hadn't adopted country ways. Uh, it's a nice uh, change of uh, tempo, adds emphasis to the chorus, by the way. The third song, Death Sound, is a twangy, reverb-heavy West Coast blues guitar. Melton shines expressively here. Uh, he's well supported by the rest of the band, and many people hear echoes of the Butterfield uh, Blues Band's guitarist, Mike Bloomfield, in this number. The Butterfield album, uh, by the way, East West, introduced many listeners to Middle Eastern uh, musical motifs for the first time. There's also some solid drumming in here by uh, Gary Chicken Hirsch. The fourth sound, Purpose Mouth, Porpoise Mouth. Uh, it's an example of 60s Baroque pop with the organ substituting for a harpsichord, which would have been more uh, common. Other examples which you might want to look up of Baroque pop during this period, Walk Away Renee by The Left Bank, uh, Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles, A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum, definitely Lady Jane by The Rolling Stones, if you can find a copy of that. Uh, tune and lyrics also evoke a sort of circus tent feel, now, what I guess the subject of the song, of the lyrics, it describes making love while high on LSD. Song 5, section 43, is my favorite track on the album. It's a dreamy instrumental in several repeating sections. MacDonald and Melton were fans of John Fahey, an acoustic guitarist and composer, and they seemed to draw inspiration for composition, especially dividing songs into movements from him. So, side two on the vinyl uh, record uh, begins with Superbird. Now, this is more West Coast blues guitar. It also has the strongest political message uh, on the album, and it sparked concerns it would be banned from radio play. When that didn't happen, however, the record company gave him the green light to uh, record another politically charged song, which would come on, on a future album <clears throat> called The Fish Cheer. Now, both uh, The Fish Cheer and Superbird have previously appeared on an EP they had recorded. Song 7, Sad and Lonely Times, is a country blues, uh, somewhat reminiscent of the birds. Um, it seems to be in one of McDonald's earlier tunes, and guitarist uh, Barry Melton sings lead on this one, as he does on the next song, Song 8, Love. Now, this song reminds me of a Memphis soul track, a la Brooker T and the MGs. Barry Melton, again credited with singing lead, Song 9, bass strings. Bruce Bartol supplies a very nice, slow walking bass line. I love walking bass lines. Uh, trippy lyrics, nicely offset by Barry Melton's tasty, restrained guitar in the background. Song 10, second from last, is, is a Doors-like melody. It's again led by the organ. Fine guitar work, presumably by Melton. Song incorporates several different subtle movements. Uh, there's more a signature a plaintive harmonica by McDonald. I love Joe McDonald's harmonica style of play. And the song doesn't overstay its welcome. It says what it has to say and moves on. I like that too. The last song, Grace, is supposedly written for Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane, who we've covered in a previous video. It uses studio effects uh, to good uh, advantage on this song. There's bells and chimes. There's some reverb vocals, which adds to the dreamy sort of ambiance that the song weaves. Unlike some of their contemporary West Coast bands, uh, the Fish were relatively unknown at the time uh, this album was recorded. They had achieved some local notoriety, but they were not yet on the world stage. Also, uh, Vanguard, their label, was not a major, major record label, unlike, let's say, the Jefferson Airplane's uh, RCA uh, label. And the Fish weren't coming off a hit album, like Jefferson Airplane's Surrealistic Pillow with two hit singles. So despite or perhaps because of that, they appear to have been given a relatively free hand in the studio. And the result was an album that just seems to define the psychedelic era in music. This album has been another touchstone record for me since I purchased it in the 1960s. And I hope it will also be one of yours. That's all for this edition. Until next time, 
and be well. And thanks for joining me. Thank you.